So this lecture is going to go over the Bohr model of the atom. Um, and this model of the atom is really built out of our line spectra. And so we talked about how different atoms give off different line spectra or discrete wavelengths of light when they're excited and they emit light. Um, and, and so this has to do something with atomic structure. And this confused people at the time, but in 1922, Niels Bohr won the Nobel Prize in Physics um, and he won it for taking the ideas of line spectra and quantized energy and applying them to the structure of the atom. So it, it was really this idea of we have these line spectra, what is going on on the atomic level to explain these wavelengths of light that we see. In addition to the Nobel Prize, I think it's interesting to note that um, Niels Bohr um, in this nice quote you can read about it in Forbes down here in 1922, Niels Bohr received the Nobel Prize for his work on sussing out the structure of atoms. For his outright brilliance, he was given a house next door to the Carlsberg Brewery Company and had a pipeline running from the brewery into his house so that he could have a never-ending supply of fresh beer on tap. Quite right, too. So I always like that quote, a nice little sort of recognition of his work. Um, this house is still present next to the Carlsberg Brewery. Um, it's now a museum dedicated to Niels Bohr and that you can go to this day. So what is the Bohr model of the atom? It, if you've studied chemistry in high school or previously, it's probably the model of the atom that you're familiar with. Um, what the Bohr model says is we have a nucleus at the middle, right? And this is similar to sort of our solar system where you have the sun at the middle and planets orbit the nucleus or orbit the sun. So here we have nucleus at the middle and electrons orbit the nucleus. And they can orbit at fixed distances from the nucleus. So electron could be here or it could be on this middle ring or it could be this outer ring. But it can't be halfway in between. It has to be at one of these rings. So these orbits are at discrete energy levels. Um, if an electron becomes excited, right, if we give this atom energy, that electron can jump an energy and go to one of the other orbits so we can push it to a higher energy state or in what we call an excited state by going to these different orbits. In the line spectra that we see for an atom has to do with these jumps in energy levels going from this inner circle to the outer circle that represents an energy and that energy would be a wavelength of light. And so what's actually taking place if we think about an absorption spectrum <clears throat> where the atom is going to absorb a wavelength of light, what's happening, and we can see this by our model of the atom or by our electron energy diagram down here where the y-axis is energy. We have an electron at some level, at this level. If we strike our atom with light, we have a wavelength of light coming in, a photon of light. If this wavelength of light has enough energy, then we can raise the energy of that electron. And by raising that energy of the electron, right, the en electron has jumped up an energy state. So we've gone up an energy state. And this gap in energy, the amount of energy it takes to get from this energy level to this energy level, is delta E equals H nu. That corresponds to a photon of light. So we have to hit it with the right photon of light that has this amount of energy to make the energy jump. And so the atom would essentially absorb that wavelength of light. So this energy gap here, the gap between this state and this state would represent a single line that's missing from one of these line spectra. If we went the opposite way and we want to look at emission spectra, that just means we're starting with an excited electron. So the electron's not at the lowest energy state. It's up here. The electron is starting at a high energy, and that energy is going to fall back down. The electron comes down to a lower energy state, and in doing so, it has to lose energy. And when it loses energy, it's going to emit light. So the energy is lost by giving off light, and this would correspond to a single wavelength of light. Um, how this applies to hydrogen, for example, what Bohr said is, again, nucleus in the middle, and we have these different orbits that are possible for an energy level. And what Bohr was able to do is correlate the wavelengths of light that you see in the line spectrum of hydrogen 
to energy transitions in his model. And so he was correctly able to to explain these wavelengths of light that we see for hydrogen. And even further, what he was able to do is he said, in addition to the visible light wavelengths, by looking at other energy levels, he predicted other wavelengths of light that showed up in the infrared and ultraviolet, which we can't see with our eye, but lo and behold, when you go look for them, sure enough, they are there. So his model of the atom, again, has this predictive power, which is one of the reasons why people liked it at the time. So before we go on, I just want to take a second and really think about this. And just consider, for example, if we start with an electronic excited electron, what would this emission spectrum look like if the electrons could go to any level? What I mean by that is, what we've been saying is the electrons are, can only show up at fixed energy levels. But if this electron can go to absolutely energy, any energy level, so if it can go to here or here or here or here or here or here or any distance in between, what would the emission spectrum look like? And if you think about that, if the electron can go to absolutely any level, what you'd have is a photon of light that corresponded to every single wavelength of light. And so what you'd end up with is a full white light rainbow of colors. So if an electron, if it was possible for an electron to be at any energy level, we'd expect a rainbow, which is not what we see at all. And this is one piece of evidence that energy must be quantized. This word quantized, all it means is the energy comes at discrete energy levels. Energy electron can be here, it can be here, or it can be here, but it can't be in between. So if we have an electronic transition, we can go from the top line to the middle line, that would be a wavelength of light. It can go from the top line to the bottom line, that would be one wavelength of light. Or it can go from the middle line to the bottom line, that would be a third wavelength of light. But what we can't do is ever go to sort of a spot halfway in between any of those lines. That's not allowed. And our line spectrum are actually, is actually evidence for this quantization of energy. So this is the basic Bohr model of the atom, right? He's able to explain the line spectrum of hydrogen. He says we have a nucleus, electrons orbit at these quantized energy levels. So electron energies are quantized. The transitions between energy levels explains the spectrum of hydrogen. And the other thing is it's treating the electron like a particle. So I don't think we mentioned that, but think about that. It's treating the electron as a particle, like a planet orbiting the sun. So the electron's going around and around and around. So this is treatment of the electron like a particle. The Bohr model does have a couple limitations. And so it's important to point these out. And those limitations are twofold. First, it only works on one electron atoms, which means it works for hydrogen and nothing else. It only works for hydrogen. Second, it doesn't work for molecules for the same reason. There's more than one electron in a molecule. So those are some pretty major limitations of the Bohr model. And that's gonna be the reason where next we're going to have to go to a more sophisticated model of the atom that's going to build off Bohr, um, but actually bring in quantum mechanics. And we'll talk about that in our next lecture. Thank you.